Hey Moonies, welcome to the Salem Fan Club Podcast. I'm Victoria L. Johnson, your host, and I'm here with Robert Boxstall, film, television, and theater actor, and of course, the iconic voice actor of the Prince Diamond from the original English dub, the Deke dub, for those who know. Um, he's one of my favorite villains, um, also one of my from one of my favorite arcs. <laughs> um, he's also an author um, with a debut novel coming out called Willow's Run, and of course we'll talk about that a little bit later. In the meantime, I want to welcome Robert to the Salem Fan Club. <laughs> Victoria, thank you. It's a it's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. As I mentioned, Prince Diamond is one of my favorite villains. I think he's one of the best villains um, and definitely one of my favorite arcs, um, the Black Moon arc. So really excited to talk to you today. Um, but Great. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing better than playing a villain. I have to tell you that. It's It sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. My, I played an awful lot of them throughout my entire career. And, um, you know, Prince Diamond was, was certainly a, a, a fun one to play. That's for sure. All right, well, I can't wait to hear a little bit more about that. But before we get into that a little bit, I want to usually ask guests, like, what's your first memory of watching Sailor Moon? But since you were part of the process of creating the show, I'm curious, when did you first hear about Sailor Moon and how did you kind of come across this role? Well, you know, I was aware of Sailor Moon, I think, before I, uh, I ended up being a part of it. Um, I, I have these kind of vague memories. Now, uh, you know, this was the 90s, so most of my memories about everything were vague. Um, but I was, you know, as an extremely busy actor at that time. It was a very busy time in my career. Uh, and uh, I, I, I moved around a lot. I didn't watch television. I was just busy all the time. But I do have vague recollections of, I'm not sure if it was uh, like graphic novels did they have graphic novels? Oh, like manga? Yeah, I actually have some right over manga. there. Manga, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of my life haunting libraries. Um, I, like, it's one of my favorite things. So much so that I retired when I was 49 and became a librarian. I, I went back to school and became a librarian. I had my own library um, in, in Northern Ontario. Uh, so I, I think I may have encountered Sailor Moon on the shelves of a library. I also may have encountered Sailor Moon through uh, some younger friends, you know, saying, oh, you should see this program. Because I, I had started doing uh, animation voiceover um, quite a long time before I was doing Sailor Moon, many, many years before. And I think that's when I started becoming aware of the world of, you know, animated work. I loved cartoons as a kid, mm -hmm. uh, Saturday morning cartoons. And, and, you know, that had such a profound influence on me. Um, you know, doing those voices, recreating those voices and those characters with friends. And then later moving overseas with my family, uh, we lived in East Africa for a number of years. And I went to an international school where I went to school with people from all over the world who had wonderful, beautiful accents from everywhere that my young ear was just soaking up like a sponge. So I became quite adept uh, as a young man doing an incredible variety of accents. Um, at least that's what my friends thought. Uh, and later on, it served me really well doing voice work. Um, so I think in the early days of when I was getting into animation voiceover um, is when I started becoming aware of all of these other programs that were going on. And I, that's where I, I remember vaguely this kind of echoey sound of this Sailor Moon, this dark kind of dramatic and, and, and being kind of fascinated by it, you know? Um, and then later on getting into the studio and, and, and seeing this stuff uh, face on and being a part of it, being in, in that little world, um, it, was, uh, it was a real tremendous feeling. I really loved that. It was almost like being in a haunted house. Uh, it, you know, all kind of echoey and, you know, the people coming out of nowhere and, and dramatic lighting. It was, it was very enjoyable. 
It definitely is. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned it. Sailor Moon is definitely a lot like probably theater where right, people kind of come out of the shadows and it's like spotlight and all of that. <laughs> I could see that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very theatrical. Yes. Yeah. And he actually, um, a librarian is like my, uh, uh, in another life, I feel like, or maybe in this life later on, I would love to be a librarian. So that's, that's really cool that you um, did that for a bit. You know what? It's never too late. Mm -hmm. Victoria, it's never too late. Uh, I, I like to think that I've had a whole series of careers in my life. And um, I, I kind of, it's great if you want to choose one and stick with it and you're happy with it and it doesn't feel like work. Uh, but I, I, I've always been curious about the next thing. And I think that's probably why being an actor suited me so well. Um, but at, it came to a, a, a point in my in my acting career where I got really sick and tired of people lying to me all the time. There's a habit in the background, um, in, in kind of hiring practices that can get a little shady and it can get very frustrating for the performers, particularly in, in film and television. I never really encountered it in, in the voiceover world, um, although I'm sure there are those who have, um, but mostly in film and television, there was a there was a lot of there were a lot of people out looking for themselves, looking out for themselves, and they'll say anything to you know kind of uh, have power over you or get you into a position that they want you to be in. And I got really tired of that, so I kind of stepped away. And when I stepped away, I thought, what is it that I would like to do with the rest of my life? And I was only forty nine. I say only because I'm I'm an old geezer now. But, uh, and, the, and one of the first things that occurred to me was, I want to look, work in a library. I would love to work in a library because I've been an avid reader. And a, like I said, a haunter of libraries all my life. Um, so it's, it's, it's never too late. Uh, and, and it was being a librarian and being surrounded by those books um, that really rekindled my interest in writing. I've always written but mostly short fiction. Um, but working in the library really, really kind of gave me a bit of a kick in the rear uh, towards my ultimate dream of, of writing a book. And that now 10 years later has, has come true. Um, but yeah. let's get back to Sailor Moon. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely do. And I love that too. It's so funny how you never realize how young you were until you're older, because I'm sure you and 20 years from now are going to look back at whatever age you are now. I'm like, oh, I was only, you know, then. it's only. That's right. And then. I actually had still a little bit of hair on the side of my head. That's what I'll be saying. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely grew with that. There's always time. I think definitely in the, in the future at some point, I'll uh, live out my librarian dreams, but for now. Uh, I hope so. Talking about Sailor Moon with lovely people. <laughs> yeah, that's nice too. Yeah, it's very fun. Um, yeah, I'm just curious if you had any like memories from recording with everyone. Um, everyone seemed like, it seemed like it was a great time, <laughs> but uh, sure. Well, here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing about it, Victoria. I mean, I have a very strong memory of, of auditioning mm -hmm. for Sailor Moon. I, I remember exactly how it all came about. Um, I remember very clearly, um, going in and out of the studio for the recording sessions and being in the studio which was you know the studio it was just a little box soundproof box right um and and uh, and, and, and that and that's it i never encountered any other cast member wow. i never worked in the studio with any other cast member so I, now I lived out of town. I've always been one of these people who lived quite a ways out of the city. This is, uh, so we're talking the early nineties, late, yeah. Is it the, no, late nineties, early two thousands? I can't remember. Maybe mid nineties. Mid nineties. I think it came out in 95, 96. So maybe okay, late so, 90s actually, yeah. So it's like 25 years ago ish. <laughs> Um, and I was, I'd been working in, in out of Toronto, uh, you know, Canada's New York, um, for 
ever. That was kind of where I was based for most of my career, but I hated living in the city. So I always lived outside the city. And at that point, I remember I was living in Perry Sound, which was a town about three hours north. So whenever I had to come in for a gig, I had to drive six hours return. Um, in the winter, it was worse because we didn't have a winter road to our house. So I had to snowmobile another five miles into the, into the house. Uh, so it was always an event going into work. Um, and, and this is at a time when there was no cell phone service beyond the outside of Toronto. And I remember my phone, it was this big brick phone that I had with an antenna. Yeah. I would set it on the dashboard of my Jeep. And as I was driving north, um, the bars would go vrrr, And I knew exactly where it was, where it, I was out of range. Um, so I remember clearly getting the call um, just as I was about to get out of range. Um, I'll tell you this whole story in a second. But um, the interesting thing about recording uh, Sailor Moon for me, that memory, is that I would arrive for my session and they would invariably be on a break. Uh, so there was only the director, I can't remember her name now, she was French. Um, uh, there was the, the director and a sound engineer. And they were invariably on a break. And I arrived there and their last actor had left 15 minutes ago. So I never got to see anybody. Wow. And I would go into the studio and I would sit in the box, I would stand there and I'd have the microphone and they had the playback screen in front. So we had to do basically lip sync to the, the, the movements of the characters' voices. Mm -hmm. um, and I would do my job. And when I was done, I would leave and once in a while, it seems to me that I would kind of bump into someone else who was in the waiting room, but I was usually in a hurry to get somewhere else or to get home because I had a big drive home. Right. And that was it. That was oh. it. <laughs> well, so, you, yeah. no, go ahead. So you can't tell when you're watching it. <laughs> it feels like everyone's, you know, in the same, the magic of technology. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Victoria, there was a time when, and, and I guess sporadically through my career as a voiceover actor, I encountered when they would bring groups of actors in and have them all in the room and do scenes together. Right. That was super rare. It's mostly you come in, do all your lines in a scene and leave. And you don't see the other actors or you wait outside while they go in and do their line and then you go in and do some other line but it was often most often separate um sailor moon case in point i never ran into anybody else and i never stood in the studio with anyone else and it was an odd kind of feeling and it it led to that kind of i think that that aura of spooky theatricality that we were talking about earlier you know Oh, and and for a bad guy, it's great, right? Yeah, you don't want to get yeah. too close to people. <laughs> That's right, and they always think that they're alone up in their fortress of solitude or whatever. That's Superman, but you know, uh, they're alone up in their powerful place. You know, right. moving chess pieces around. So that that suited me fine for the character of Prince Diamond. And uh, uh, what's his name? Samar Sapphire. No, ta 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 so, oh hell, he's got a really strange name. Uh, I, I can't, I don't remember. I have it's a character you played? It's another character that I played. Yeah. Here he is. Tsunawataro. Tsunawataro. Hmm. Sounds uh, like uh, Yoda. Oh, okay. Cool. Yes, he has a pet eyeball that floats around of course as you do as a villain <laughs> sure why not so uh, 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 so that leads me to tell you about him um mm -hmm. is that uh so i was in toronto for a few days uh as i recall during the week which is usually what i would do i'd stay around for a couple of days and i would be leaving on a friday afternoon the traffic was always bad and i was fighting my way north to get out of the city 
to be with my family after having been away all week. Right. And my phone rang and my manager said, uh, how's your Yoda? <laughs> and I said, I, I don't understand what you mean. I'm almost, she said, where are you? I said, I'm out of town. I have just made it out of the city. And that was like the worst, toughest part of the drive. Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, well, can you do a Yoda? I said, yeah, sure. I can do Yoda. I can do Yoda standing on my head. Why? Why? She said, well, they're looking for a Yoda. Uh, I said, okay, so should I come back in on Monday? She said, no, they want to see you right now. Oh my gosh. And it was like, oh, okay. So I, 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 I called my wife and said, you know, there's this thing. So I, I have to do it, it's, you know? So I turned around, I drove the other hour back through fighting through traffic mm -hmm. and I got smacked downtown, got into the studio and they wanted to hear my Yoda. And it was just this French woman. I wish the hell I could remember her name. She was uh, lovely. Uh, and she said, you know, we wanted to sound kind of like Yoda, but not exactly. So I did her, I did my Yoda for her. Uh, she gave me a couple of lines to read in the studio. And she seemed happy. And she said, okay, can you read this other thing? Just, you know, use your own voice. So I did. She said, would you use a different voice for this? I said, okay, I can try another. So anyway, and then I, I said, is that it? She went, yep, that's it. Thank you for coming in. And that's usually how it goes, you know, bye-bye mm -hmm. now. So I got into the car and I drove out of town again. So, this, so by now I, I'm like, I've been in the car for three hours right. in traffic by the time I get out of the city limits again. And my phone rings again. And uh, I, I saw that it was my my manager and i said no no i'm not coming back in <laughs> uh, there were no hands free back then and mm -hmm. i was driving stick you know oh, and so wow. I'm, I'm fighting along and every time you put it up to your ear it would hang up you know yeah um God. so uh she said um no you got the job mm -hmm. they don't want you back you got the job so i was absolutely thrilled by that to hear that news um and I thought of my old friend, John Stalker, another brilliant voice actor, mm -hmm. who was the first guy I knew to have a car phone. And I had said to him, what is that? What are you showing off? <laughs> what is that? And he said, no, look, I got this car phone. The first day I had it, it paid for itself. I got a gig while I was driving. I got the gig and I turned around and I went. And did it. So I thought of him and I thanked him, I called him up. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, the next week I started with this Sailor Moon contract. Right. And it was, it happened at a very, very good time in our lives and in my work life. And it, that for some reason, they managed to just slot in every recording session at a perfect time when I had a window to be able to work. Nice. So I have very positive memories of that work experience. They always paid on time, um, which is, <laughs> right and i heard through the grapevine that there were a number of other actors who i really love and admire who were cast members mm -hmm. uh, among them most foremost among them was my dear friend susan Rowe. yeah who's um, been on the podcast <laughs> she's just she's the best she's, she's so the lovely. best mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh you know she's she's uh she's the real deal mm -hmm. um all around so uh, yeah, so when I heard that, I thought, well, I'm in really good company mm -hmm. uh, and this can't help but be successful, you know. And then I forgot about it. I finished <laughs> and, 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 and I forgot I moved on. Right. Right. As one does in yeah. the voiceover industry. You move on to the next cartoon. And the short on. arc too. Sometimes, you know, there are. Uh, there have been others. I mean, I, I did one series called The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin, which seemed to go on for like a long, long time. And I had friends who did Care Bears and it went on for years that they would keep going back into the studio. Right. Um, Sailor Moon wasn't like that for me. I, I don't think I did that many episodes. I may have done like 16 or 20 episodes or something. Right. And I had two characters I think they, they, they slid me in for a couple of ancillary characters, you know, these people who have one or two lines or you know, look out, you know, those kind of people. Um, 
I think they slid me in for a couple of those. But beyond that, it was a fairly, you know, compact uh, series of recording sessions. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm happy, even though you didn't get to spend time with any of the other voice actors, I'm happy it was a positive experience. Um, getting paid on time is always memorable. So I yes. definitely understand yes. that. And, you um, know, uh, years later, Victoria, um, years later, uh, there has there has been this kind of resurgence and interest in 90s animation. Yeah. Um, so now, oddly enough, I'm starting to be invited to these conventions, mm -hmm. which I had never even considered before. I never even thought that I would ever be, how do I rate, you know? But uh, so I did my first convention just before the pandemic broke out. Mm -hmm. um, and they've invited me to subsequent ones, which I haven't been comfortable attending, but I'm going to another one in May and then another one in August. And now there's a renewed interest for some reason, in my having done Sailor Moon, among a few other series that are, a lot of people are big, big fans, and, and that's just wonderful. You know, the only, the only fan mail I ever received, you're talking to a Canadian actor, we, you know, we don't have a star system here, we don't have, mm -hmm. we keep a low profile, we're completely safe walking in public, you know, it's great. Yeah. It's, a, it's very it's really nice um and unless you're searching for fame then it's just dead boring for most people um but those of us who just like to keep a low profile it's wonderful mm -hmm. uh, but occasionally there'd be a little bit of fan mail that slips through and gets to your agent or your manager and it was always sailor moon oh wow always mm -hmm. i didn't get any other fan mail mm -hmm. for any other project out of the hundreds of projects that I've done with Sailor Moon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm to be less long, but I, I, I mean, as someone who does this podcast, I definitely understand. Like, I think Sailor Moon just elicits so much feelings and nostalgia for yeah. some people, and it just has that that magic to it. Um, yes, yeah, so I definitely, definitely, it's definitely not surprising. <laughs> um, and this year is actually the 30th anniversary of um, when it first aired in Japan. So I think that's is that so. Crazy. Another reason why things are ramping up and, uh, you know, there was a, a reboot um, movie for the reboot that came out on Netflix last year. So there's a lot of lot of things in the works. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, And again, like Prince Diamond is such a memorable character. Um, so I can, I'm not surprised people are reaching out. Which cons are you going to? Well, the one that I'm going to, I'm going to one here. It's called the Deep River Geek Fest. Ooh, that sounds fun. It, it actually does. Um, <laughs> And uh, they're they're doing a whole thing for me where they're they're gonna help me promote my book as well. Uh, right. They're setting stuff up with the public library and all of this kind of thing. So that's that's really great. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another uh, there's another convention here uh, in Ottawa, and, I, and I, there's two of them, and I can't I I would I I can't remember honestly what their names both are. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a guy who runs one and it's nearby my house, actually. I can almost walk there. Um, and I, that was the first con that I went to. And I'm going to be going back there in, in August. Nice. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, I am yeah. looking forward to it. I went to my first con uh, uh, since the pandemic last um, November and had a lot okay. of fun. So, yeah, so I'm really... Um, excited to get back into uh conventions again you know safely but <laughs> slowly yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean I, I don't know that many people are going to want to have their pictures taken with me because i'll be wearing a mask i'm still going to be wearing one i've got we've yeah. got family members who are you know mm -hmm. elderly and right you know, yeah. immunocompromised yeah. and all that so, you know yeah i mean i took i took pictures with people i had my mask on they had their mask on and i was like i'm still happy <laughs> <laughs> good Good. that's the way to be be positive yeah it's it's not some stranger under there it's it's the right. person who they say it is you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i feel like oh, again and then they have like the protectors at some of them too so yeah yeah extra precaution if that makes you feel sure better. um i'm curious if you had um just any thoughts about playing the role i mean i think he's 
Prince Diamond's one of the few um, male villains, actually. And, you know, he likes Sailor Moon and there's like all this. He kidnaps her at one point, on. doesn't he? Yeah, he kidnaps her. Yeah. I'm curious, like how you felt as you were like portraying this character and you're like, oh my God, this man is a real villain. <laughs> like what's going on? You know, I, 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 I remember Prince Diamond as being, the, the thing about playing a bad guy is that you don't think you're a bad guy, mm. right? You have to be convinced that you're not evil, that you're just, you're doing the right thing. Um, so uh, it, for, what, for all of his kind of conflicted motivations and whatnot, um, he was generally quite a kind of, a, um, I remember him as being soft-spoken and articulate. And I always felt that he, he would stand, I always, I know I remember being in the studio, I would always stand very, very straight. Hmm. when I played Prince Diamond. Very regal. <laughs> well, kind of regal, well-bred, classically educated, all of right. those things that we talk about with a lot of the, you know, bad people, bad guys, um, yeah. is that, you know, they have a classical education in there and they, 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 they read a lot. And they, uh, they can play chess very well and, and certain things just bore them. Yeah. Um, so I, that regal is a good word. So that's how I kind of carried myself uh, playing him. And, and that is one of the things that I'm sure that you've, you know, come across this, a lot of your uh, guests, voiceover artists would have articulated that we use our whole body mm -hmm. when we're doing voiceover work. Yeah. It's super important that, and it does come across through the microphone um that we use our whole body yeah. Uh, so yeah so that was that's what i do remember about playing prince diamond was that i stood very very erect and kept my chin up and and I also you know that that kind of whispery um i, I hit all my t's i ended every I, I pronounced my d's you know it was all it was very articulate this guy so yeah. that's what I remember about the that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think uh, Susan Roman on the show, she mentioned that she always wore her hair in a ponytail because that's how Sailor Jupiter wears her hair. It's like a similar um, similar uh, process almost. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, wear my hair in a ponytail. <laughs> yeah. But at that time, I probably did as well. Oh. Uh, or I would have... Well, I had longer hair, so I, I may have like brought some over my eye and stuff like like old diamond. Yeah. Uh, you know, doing a bit of that stuff. We have uh, white hair now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, some. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> uh, anyhow. Uh, yeah. So. So. Yeah. So that's what uh, I, I certainly remember from uh, from Prince Diamond. The other guy, uh, but the, the Yoda fellow, I remember mm -hmm. kind of squatting for him um because as i recall he was always in a sitting position almost like a cross-legged sit but that may not be true but in my mind that's how i remember him so as i i may have been sitting on a stool cross-legged to do the voice um he was always kind of mm, ah, oh, yes why are you oh. you know there was a lot of that stuff um he laughed a lot and, and I'm not sure I think he coughed quite a bit I'm not hmm. sure about that I'm not a healthy guy um, <laughs> that's a great Yoda by the way so I definitely <laughs> see how you got the job um, well let's see I haven't done it in 25 years I came right back <laughs> head on to Disney muscle memory <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny and which series was that for that the Yoda character, do you remember? It's Sailor Moon. Oh, it's also Sailor Moon. Okay, I don't remember that character. I gotta look them up. Yeah, Tsunu Wataro. Tsunu Wataro, who is that? I have to look them up. All right. <laughs> you'll, you'll find him. He yeah, had a little he had a little team and he had this, I swear to God, he had this pet eyeball that had wings on it. Oh, I think it was I always floating up and down on this plinth. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think he, in the English, it might have been, is that zirconia, maybe? Yeah, that's it. Zirconia. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Zirconia. So he had a, he had a big hood, mm -hmm. you know, covering him up. You couldn't see much. He was very shadowy. Zirconia. You know, he does look like Yoda. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He certainly sounds like him. Yeah. Now, yeah. I have, now when I go back and watch, I'm not going to be able to unhear <laughs> like it's Yoda. <laughs> yeah. No, you won't. And in fact, I, uh, uh, where was I? I was, I was, I don't know, creeping around on some, on some uh, fan sites, just trying to remember some things. And uh, somebody had written in, uh, somebody had made a comment that, you know, they just kind of brushed it off that, oh, anybody could do a Yoda. Somebody did a Yoda for this voice of Zirconia. And I thought, yeah, anybody can do a Yoda. But not like me. No. <laughs> And besides, buddy, you didn't get paid to do it. I did. <laughs> that is true. Not everyone can do a Yoda and not not well. <laughs> not a believable. No, it's common. You know, it's common. And a lot of people do it, uh, you know, to entertain their friends. Doesn't mean that they're good at it mm -hmm. uh, or that they could do it professionally. But, right. um, you know, it's the same back when I was younger, back long before you were born. Um, there was a group of, of guys out of England called Monty Python's Flying Circus. Mm. And these guys uh, were so influential on my generation that um, everybody I knew was doing these Monty Python routines all the time at school. Right. And everybody thought that they could do them well, and they couldn't. They were terrible. <laughs> they were terrible. But there were a few that could do it well, and they ended up doing voiceover work. But you know, anyway. Well, I have to ask, what makes a good Yoda? Do you think a good Yoda voice? What makes a good Yoda? Yeah. Well, I think that the fact that it has to be very, very deep in the throat. Mm -hmm. It can't just be in the front of the voice. It can't be ah in here, mm -hmm. uh, like at, uh, at the back of the throat. It has to be way down that's where it has to originate from and the whole throat is vibrating not just the vocal cords mm -hmm. there also there's a placement of the front teeth that has to be able to catch a sound that bounces it up into the microphone that uh he doesn't just he doesn't articulate the same way we do using a lot of the front uh the back of the front teeth he uses a lot of the back of the the bottom teeth mm -hmm. um so uh, you know th there's some kind of vocal calisthenics you have to do i think to get a good yoda well to get a, a good impersonation of anybody you have to find out what the mechanics of their mouth is doing mm -hmm. are yeah. doing that makes sense yeah 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 I'm like does yoda have teeth so <laughs> that makes sense yeah. yeah does yoda have teeth it's right. like does a chicken mm -hmm. have teeth Mm -hmm. Yoda looks kind of funny. I don't know. I, I I don't remember teeth. I don't remember teeth either. So that, that makes yeah. sense thinking about how he might. I always it. thought that he had a bit of a protruding jaw sound. I don't know by the look of him. I don't remember what he looks like really. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time, anyhow. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I feel like I don't know. Maybe I'll do a better Yoda at some point. I don't think I've ever done a tried to do a Yoda voice, but I feel like I'll definitely try at some point with this advice, um, or someone listening. Hopefully, maybe they'll better their Yoda voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to talk about this book though, um, Willow's Run, which is about a woman on the run from her sadistic husband and a stolen million-dollar motorhome is trapped in a small town. That sounds fascinating. I love stories that center around women. Um, seems like she's going to do some really cool things. <laughs> what inspired you to write this story? And um, is there anything else about it that you want to share? Well, uh, the inspiration for the story came from the notion, from the idea that I wanted, I wanted to write a, a book. And um, I had got it in my head that I was going to do this. We were living up north. I had a little uh, kind of, they called it a bunky shed, shack. It was a, you know, a little miniature house on the edge of this lake we were living on. 
and had a big window overlooking the lake and a bed. And I built a desk in there. And I thought, okay, this is where I'm gonna write my book. And I read all kinds of books about writing. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you which one in my mind was the best, uh, but I read like all of them. Because I wanted to prepare for this. And I also worked at a job that I didn't like. Um, it was part of the library thing, but it was a digitization uh, technological job. I was at a desk in front of a computer for a solid year um, so that I could take a year off afterwards. So I saved up all my money and then I took a year off to write this book. So it was, it was planned a long time in advance. And I wasn't acting anymore. I wasn't going to the city for auditions anymore. So I had the time, I had the focus. So uh, it was, I, I built up to it for a long time. And then I, uh, I worked on it uh, for a long time. The writing of it took me almost a year. And to get to publication was 10 years. Wow. Now, during that time, I wasn't just farming the book around. I was, I was working on it. I did 19 rewrites as well as dozens and dozens and dozens of you know, pass-throughs and changes and all of this. And then it went through editorial process twice with one editor and went through an editorial pr process another time with a copy editor. I had early readers, I had proofreaders, I've hired all of these people. Um, and then um, I looked for a, uh, an agent, a uh, literary agent. Mm -hmm. I was traveling in Europe for a year at that time. So I had, I had time to, you know, query all of these agents all around the world. And uh, I queried 73 uh, agents, all of whom I had looked for very, very specifically and deliberately to see, okay, that's the person I want. Yeah. I think they would, I think that they would want to. And um, I received responses from two of them. Mm -hmm. And one said, no. And one said, I liked what I read, but no. And I kind of thought, you know, this, this isn't the way I want to do this. And I looked further into the state of the, the publishing game. And I realized that it would behoove me to publish it independently. And I would learn a lot more. And so I brought this book to market, to reality, myself. But using all the same level of profession, professionals at every level that the, the big five publishers do. So it is, it's kind of a, a mirror of everything that they do, except I don't have access to every bookstore. That's all. I will have access to bookstores, but not every bookstore like they do. That's right. the difference. So, um, my wife has my only copy of the book. I don't know why it's not down here. Um, but so writing it uh, was, it was an incredible experience. Uh, the initial writing it, writing of it. And then uh, the, 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 the remainder of the work on the book was just really, really hard, lonely, long work. Um, uh, but there's nothing more I can say about it. I mean, I, I loved most of it, but it was, uh, it's not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, and you have to know, now I'm giving advice on writing. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. I, I mentioned uh, before we started recording, I'm trying to write my own novel. So I take in I, all the advice <laughs> and all of this is sounding very familiar as well, as far as being a, a hard process. <laughs> but go ahead. It is, it is. And, and you know, uh, it, it's, it's intricately uh, 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 interwebbed, interlaced with reading. I mean, I, I think you, you really have to have very strong and constant reading habits in order to be a writer. Um, and you also, um, well, you also have to go out there and read uh, uh, about every other writer's experience. Uh, but like I said, uh, you, you know, I mean, the, the book that I found the most helpful was uh, Stephen King's book called On Writing. I think it's, it's just absolutely brilliant. It's just, 
shoot from the hip, write the book. Don't follow know. any rules. What's that? I said he would know. I feel like well, but, yeah. You know, yes, he would know, and and you know, he, it may not be everybody's cup of tea. He's not telling you to write horror stories. He's not telling you to do anything, but he is saying this is what worked for me, and this is how I have taught students over the years, um, and this is what writing is. I don't care what you write or how you write, but this is what writing is. Um, and he's absolutely correct. Of course, he is. Uh, because he's a he's a brilliant writer, whether you like his writing or not, you know. Um, and I did not aspire to write a Stephen King novel, but I wanted to learn the disciplines of writing, the reality of writing. And uh, it's very clear in in that book. So I really highly recommend that book uh, to read. Um, the other thing, though, that I did was once I had decided I was going to write the novel, was uh, for, for the year before that, while I was digitizing, I was writing short fiction. And I, 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 I was toying with story ideas, grabbing a story, and then just writing either a short story or a piece of flash fiction or uh, a novella, um, all you know, getting the practice of writing, the daily discipline of writing, and then learning how to submit it um, to get published in literary magazines all over the world. And eventually that's what I started doing was I started getting published. And I wanted to do that so that I would have a bit of a track record. Um, so I got published in a whole bunch of literary magazines uh, for my short stories and my short fiction and my flash fiction. Um, so by the time I started writing the book, um, my muscles were kind of flexed and warmed up, you know? Uh, so I, <laughs> I wrote it um, on paper with, with a pen. Um, I didn't yeah. use a computer. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't think. I, I, I wrote, I, I used no technology whatsoever. I wrote by candlelight <laughs> with candles that I, I found boxes of candles at uh, the Salvation Army uh, store, the thrift store That's for a dollar. I yeah. just found a big box of candles because uh, I had no electricity in this little bunkie I was writing in anywhere. And I I would use found pens, the pens that I found that people left behind in the library or, you know, I found on the ground or whatever. I used found pens. And I bought a bunch of these little um, workbooks, which I just love. It's crazy. But these things here. Ooh, those look pretty they're just, they're just little little paper workbooks yeah and 32 pages and i i've got they're multicolored this one's 80 pages Ooh. um now i got a a, a a like package of them hundreds of them for a dollar at this store that was going out of business and i wrote my first novel on in those in those workbooks uh, by candlelight with a with a found pen. Yeah. Um, and then, then I transferred it over to the computer. But I wrote forward. I never stopped, never, not once. I never stopped and read a single word that I had written. I never went back. I never went back at the end of the day or the following day, or if 20 chapters in, I brought a character back from the first chapter. I did not go back and look up her name if I'd forgotten. I just made up a new one and wrote something in the margin saying, check this name. Uh, I just kept going forward. So there was no editorial process whatsoever. And I think that was the secret to the success of actually getting to the words, the end. Yeah, that's what I hear a lot is just to write. <laughs> and literally get paper get words on the page and you know know that it's not going to be perfect it may not even be good the first time around it's literally oh, no, no, no. getting it down on paper and then you go back and not yeah. to edit as you go <laughs> like you said I mean you have to know that it's yeah. going to be terrible the first time mm -hmm. around um, yeah. and, you know the Hemingway has an expression for that you can look it up I, I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you what it is right now because it's kind of rude 
but yeah. he, he describes what the first draft of anything is. Uh, you know, it's, it's garbage, it's terrible. But there are seeds of ideas in there that you can, right. you can clean the stuff up around it because most of what the first draft is, when you go back and read it, is you can watch yourself getting to something. You watch your journey of writing, getting to something good, and you can get rid of all that stuff, right? But if you try to get rid of it as you go, you're never gonna get anywhere. But that's, you know, my process is called seat of the pants writing, pants writing. And then there's, then there's people who, who do outline writing. So they outline the whole story and they write to that. Um, so those are the kind of the two ways of doing it. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I started outlining and then um, I was like, I need to just start writing because I was just like getting caught up in this outline. And I was like, I'll figure it out along the way, <laughs> see what happens and I can fix well, it. Well, it is a good way. I, I mean, it's not for everybody, but I sure liked it. Um, and, you know, you get to discover things. Uh, you know, the, uh, he, Stephen King also says, just write the book that you want to read. Right. So that's what I wrote when I wrote Willow's Run. Uh, it wasn't always called Willow's Run, but that doesn't matter. Um, it is now. Uh, I, I, I wrote all of the kinds of things and in the style that I like to read. And it worked out well because, you know, since I've written it, I'm sure I've read the book. I've had to read the book 100 or 150 times. And it's 450 pages long you know, that it's an effort to do that. Um, and I still like it. I still enjoy reading. it. So that's a big part of it, right? To write something that you want to read. That's important. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, it definitely sounds interesting, as I mentioned before, um, you know, Woman on the Run sounds, sounds, sounds exciting. <laughs> she's, uh, she's, she's, she's a very unique character. She's a, 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 a an ex, um, Olympic volleyball player. Um, and she's six foot six. Ooh. So she's, she's kind of a giant. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and she ends up in this small town where she really stands out and there's this really bad man looking at trying to find her. Um, and there's a small group of people in this town. Not all of them are who they seem to be. Uh, and they, they set about kind of protecting her a little bit. Um, even though she says she doesn't need protection or want protection, they go out of their way to, to help her a bit. Um, and she ends up discovering the really deep, dark secrets in this small town. Uh, that, that it gets dangerous. So it's, there's not only danger that she's facing in this town, but the danger of this bad ex-husband coming to look, and he's getting closer all the time. Um, it's exciting, it's dark, it's very moody. It all takes place in one week during a nonstop rainstorm. Oh, wow. Um, there are secret passages in this old building that she ends up hiding out in. There are things hidden, there are uh, tunnels, there are, there's, you know, there's a gun, there's a, there's a psychotic killer on the loose. There's all this really interesting stuff. And there's a love story in the middle of it. Ooh, okay. <laughs> yep. And uh, the dialogue can be at times quite humorous. Okay. Um, if, okay. if you look at the reviews on Amazon, you'll see that the early reviews are coming in and they're all five stars so far, like wood. Yay. Um, and people are saying that they they got caught up. It's a, it's a page turner. Okay, well, I am very excited to read it. I love mystery. I love um, humor. I love romance. Um, you said it's secret passageways. I was like, I'm in. I love a good <laughs> passageway. <laughs> Me too. Small town hiding, hiding backgrounds and mysteries. <laughs> I mean, there's, there, what's there not to love in all of that? There's, you know, it's it's an it's an enjoyable beach read, a cottage read, an airplane read. It's not. It's not literature. I never set out to write that. I am not that kind of writer. I don't pretend to be. Um, but it is, it's very entertaining. Um, yeah, and you need that. And yeah, 
and I, I have some people that I'm that are going to be looking at it uh, in terms of selling the film rights. So I'm hoping that will be an avenue that you know we can follow uh, at some point in the next few months. Yeah. Um, but this is, you know what, this is interesting because this is the first time I've talked about it publicly. Um, I, I got it to press uh, through Amazon in what I'm calling a soft launch, which is I've only told about 100 people about it. And they've bought the book and they're reading it and they're slowly going to be, you know, kind of sending out reviews and all this kind of stuff. But I'm not going to do a launch until the end of May. So this is the first time that I am actually talking about this book in public. So this is a sneak mm -hmm. peek. I love exclusives. Yes, <laughs> it is. All right. Well, I will definitely share that with uh, listeners when I post this. Be like, listen about his, his book for the first time on the podcast. Awesome. <laughs> you know, and you can, you can get it. on. I've, I've done it as an audio book. So if somebody wants to listen to my voice reading my own book, then it's it's out there and it's already on like 30 platforms worldwide. You so know, whatever... I, I'm thinking about like Prince Diamond reading a book about like mysteries. Sounds very, very enticing. There it is. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, yeah. So it's anywhere you want, anywhere where you get your audiobooks, you will find Willow's Run. Um, and if you're at all, you know, lost in the woods, you can just go to my website at uh, robertboxstall.com. Yeah. And of course, I'll drop all the links for anyone listening in the podcast description and notes. So you can click there and buy it and check everything out if you want to. Um, and I definitely will be too. Uh, <laughs> I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Thank you. Of course. Um, we kind of talked about advice already, but you know, um, the last question I ask everyone is to create their Santa Moon says phrase. So just like Sailor Moon had her Santa Moon says phrase at the end of every episode, what would your phrase be? And do the Sailor Robert says or Prince Diamond says? <laughs> Prince Diamond says, you can get everything you want. Everything. Well, I feel scared. So <laughs> don't be scared. <laughs> oh, that's scared. <laughs> that was very convincing, though. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely can from the man who has had many lives, many careers, and is successful at all of them. I I believe you. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm curious to know what is next for you and where can people find you? Um, what's next for me? Gosh, well, I, I'm 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 writing another, uh, I've written another book. Um, it's not going to be out for about another year. It's called She Carried the Sea. It's completely different from Willow's Run. Uh, it, it is more of a ghost story um, um, about loss and, 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 and sadness and things like that. But there's, you know, with ghosts. Um, and uh, I, I mean, recently I did a, I went back uh, and did a kind of a feature film, uh, a big, you know, Hollywood style feature film where uh, I was one of the leads and I, I played against uh, a, a guy who was a childhood hero of mine, uh, Mr. Mel Gibson. Uh, so I got to do a lot of scenes with him. And uh, 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 Marianne Jean-Baptiste, who is a brilliant, brilliant uh, actor, as well as uh, Walton Goggins. So we had, we had a really good time uh, doing this feature film last year. Uh, it's out now, I think, on Amazon Prime or something. It's called Fat Man. It's a really super dark shoot 'em up Christmas movie. Okay, well, I love a shoot 'em up so that's, that's interesting, too. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's hilariously crazy, this movie. Yeah. Um, so, and I, you know, I'm coming, kind of hoping for another one of those to come along in the next couple of years, but really I'm, I was, you know, I'm, I'm chained to the desk. Uh, I'm going to be marketing this Willow's run for the next, uh, six or eight months and, uh, and, and finishing up the, the next draft of, uh, she carried the sea. That's what I'm doing. That sounds well, so good. I'm very excited, um, for this book, for everything that you're going to be doing. I'll definitely be on the lookout for the next book as well. Although ghosts are a little scary for me, but I might check it out. <laughs> it's not a kind of a boo book. It's not that. Just 
hanging in the distance. Just creepy. It's yeah. Just, what's going on kind of stuff. Yeah. And then, again, it's going to be another female uh, main character, mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. which I, I just, I just find female main characters so much more interesting. Um, mm -hmm. There's just so much more going on. I agree. Um, yeah. It's just, <laughs> it's true. You know, it's just true. Yeah. Well, once again, I am Victoria L. Johnson, host of the Salem and Fan Club podcast. You can find me at Miss Old School on Twitter and Instagram, also on TikTok, where I sometimes put up videos at Sailor Victoria. Um, you can also find the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a review if you can. And uh, we also have merch at MooniesClub.com. So if you want to buy some merch, you can get that over there. And thanks for listening, Moonies. And thank you, Robert, for coming on the Salem and Fan Club. Thank you so much, Victoria. It's been a pleasure. Same.